Good afternoon, everybody. How are you? <laughs> Hope you're as good as I am, because I feel terrific. It's a real pleasure to be here and just to be part of uh, Jane Norman's great life. Uh, last time I saw her was uh, last year when we did a half hour show with her, and she was not only beautiful, she was very well aware of what's going on. She was a model citizen. She was just perfect, and one of the easiest interviews I've ever done. So right now, we're going to have a number of people talk about her. First of all, we're going to have Brad Seekoff, Vice President of Broadcast Pioneers, of director of our interview series here. Pioneers of Philadelphia Broadcasting wants to say uh, many words about Jane because he was part of that interview. So without further ado, Brad, come on up and say a few words. Hi guys, how are you? This is unusual to be on this side of the camera, but anyhow. Uh, we did the interview with Jane, it was kind of funny because she calls me up all upset. She's a perfectionist, and I can't remember if she referred to lions as tigers or tigers or lions, but she says, how are we gonna fix this? My, my legacy can't be wrong. I said, don't worry about it, we can fix it. She said, how? There's no way. So we did it, we took pieces of sentences and moved them around, cut to Bill when she was talking for that little bit, so calls me up and says, oh, I can't thank you enough for doing this, this is my legacy, these series are so important. We capture a lot of people who are in the broadcast business and retired and stuff like that. And uh, she says to me, because you know, it's so important because this may be my last interview. And it turned out to be, but uh, Bill did a great job on that, but it shows how important that series is to do, because we've captured quite a few people, including uh, um, some actors and actresses that were like 100 years old, so we catch a lot of the last of that generation. So if you get a chance, go to the YouTube channel and watch it, they're great stuff. And she was a great talent to work with. Thank you, thank you, Brad. Now let's go to Ed Cunningham. Ed started at WDVR, now, uh, now FM, and then he moved to WFLN Radio as an announcer. He then came to WHYY in 1972, where he's been there for about 100 years. <laughs> Cunningham is also a member of the Philadelphia Hall of Fame. Come on in, Ed. You got to do better than that, Bill, to get back into my graces after that. I will point out, by the way, back in eighth grade, about a hundred years ago, I was thoroughly in love with Bill's sister, Barbara Baldini. Uh, to put it mildly, it was an affection that was unrequited. So it was an early lesson for me in, in the uh, disappointments of life. So it was very valuable in that way. And of course, it's great to see Bill again, an old neighbor from back in Overbrook. Yeah, Jane Norman, I, I have lived in Philadelphia all my life. I mean, I always tell people I have not really lived one minute outside the city limits of Philadelphia. I'm just a Philly guy, born and bred all the way, born in South Philly, raised in Overbrook. And I'm one of the charter members of the baby boom era. I mean, I've got to be one of the oldest folks, born in 1946, right after the war. And that one was, of course, as we all know, when television was exploding across the country. And the local state, what you may not know is, I mean, these networks today, and especially the cable networks too, are almighty on television. That was not the, the case in the early years after the Second World War. These television networks were really fledgling and had a difficult time getting up to speed. And what they did was to rely on local stations to provide a lot of programming for the network and a lot of talent. And Philadelphia was very, very big in that way with uh, everything from Big Top to uh, uh, other programs, children's programs that were seen around the country. And that's when I started watching television. That's the way my formative experiences were made. And I loved all the children's programs. I can go back far enough to remember Mr. Rivets and Willie the Worm. How many of you remember that? 
All right, there's some of you, yes, and some are saying, ooh, a worm? Well, trust me, it, it was true. And, I, and of course, the great legendary Sally Starr, whom we all remember and revere. And I remember when I had the chance to become a producer at WHYY, I harbored the idea, wouldn't it be wonderful to take people back to their childhoods to experience these programs that really had such an effect on them growing up. And it was an amazing thing, I guess from the late 40s, well into the 80s in the case of Captain Noah, these programs are very important on a local level. So I decided I wanted to do a program uh, that took people back to their childhoods in the best way possible in the company of Mr. Rivets and Chief Halftown and Sally Starr and Bertie the Bunyan and all the rest of them. And I said to myself, who am I going to get to be a, a consultant about all things Philadelphia broadcasting? And there was only one name that came to mind and he's eating cheesecake right now as we speak. That'd be Jerry Wilkinson who was my consultant on that program because nobody, the man is a walking encyclopedia about local broadcasting and he did a great job for me as our consultant. Which brings us to Jane Norman very quickly. Now I, I did this, uh, this preface here because my uh, relationship with Jane Norman was not a, a very long one. Uh, I didn't really know her well. Uh, her program uh, of Pixan, of course, came on the air after I, I mean, I was a teenager, so aside from her cute gams, I wasn't really interested in uh, the children's shows of that sort. That, that wasn't too bad. But anyway, uh, so I didn't really know her, but I knew this. No children's show that I would put on the air on WHYY would be complete without Pixan. So that was an absolute must, along with Sally Starr, Gene London, and a few of the others. So that is how I got to know Jane Norman in the business sense. And I think other people will tell you about the talents that Jane uh, had as a writer, a producer, a talent, an actress, a singer, my word, she could even fly through the air. She had all these talents that really give us great memories now. But it was my uh, exposure to Jane that showed me another aspect of her personality is she was a very savvy businesswoman. Because I'll tell you, she, along with uh, Jean London, owned the rights to their programs that aired on Channel 10. Now, I'm not sure how the business arrangements went. I mean, in our case, when we got stuff from Chief Halftown and Happy the Clown and so forth, we got them through WPVI. But in these two cases, Gene London and Jane Norman, they owned the rights to their material. Uh, there you go. All right. Very good. We, we, uh, it's very smart talent. And that's, that's the point, really, that I'm making is that in addition to all these other talents, she knew what she wanted to do business-wise. And so she said, if you want the footage, that's fine, but it's going to cost you, I forget, whatever the amount of money was, but it was not inconsiderable. And I remember talking to my boss at WHYY, and I said, well, Jane wants this X number of dollars. He said, I don't know, do you think we can do this program? with Jane Norman as Pixan with like still pictures and that sort of thing. Well, I don't need to tell you, when we think of Jane, when we think of Pixan, we think of her flying through the air. And I said, there's just no way this program is going to mean anything to anybody if we don't take them back to their childhoods and let them re-experience these programs as, as they were broadcast. We gotta do this, it's gonna be worth it. Well, we decided, yep, that was the way to go. Same with Gene London, we paid him to do the same. And boy, did it make a difference for us. And it was certainly one of the most successful programs that we've ever produced at WHYY. Probably some of the best reviews I've ever gotten for a program on that station. Not all of them were so good. But this was, it was a wonderful experience. And I learned something that it's almost unfair to have so many talents, to be such a great performer, a great musician, a great producer, and also to be a very savvy business person. That was Jane Norman. And that's my reminiscence. Thanks, folks. Thank you, Ed. I, I don't know if all of you know that she was 
a Philadelphia girl thrown through. She went to Albany High School and went to Temple. She was a education major. She also took radio and TV as kind of a backup plan, but she really wanted to be a teacher. And she was a teacher after uh, college for four years. And she taught kindergarten, and she used her musical ability to help teach the children. What most people don't know is that two and a half years old, she was already playing Mozart and Beethoven. I think at eight years old, she wrote a piece that was played by Eugene Ormandy in the Philadelphia Orchestra. So I thought you people like to know this little bit of trivia you might not know about. Then she went on to be Pixan, but the, the genesis of Pixan was teaching kindergarten and using music. Our next speaker is David Madden. David is a famous Philadelphian, another local guy, big star on KYW forever. David, come on up and give us a few words about Pixan. Thanks, Bill. Appreciate that. And uh, I got to tell you, as somebody who's total aside here, as someone who still goes out and covers news on the street, um, we miss you, Bill. We really do. As, um, and this is and this is no aspersion to anyone who's working today, but. There is a difference, and I think most of the people here in this room would understand what I'm about to say. The old school of journalism, uh, you know, we have had a way of approaching news stories and people that we would interview. I don't see that anymore, and it bothers the hell out of me. So to, to be able to see you today and, you know, just, just to be able to reminisce about some of the stories we've done over the years. But, I mean, yeah, I know you don't want to come back. <laughs> okay, I know that. But uh, I just want you to know, we, we miss you a lot. So uh, let's talk Pixan. As, as somebody who never met Jane Norman, certainly knew about her, although, Ed, your, your stories were remarkable. Uh, the idea that she was as savvy a business person is, is something I had no clue about. Wish I knew some of that stuff. Right, exactly. You know, I mean, that would help with union negotiations if I would have known. But, uh, you know, I guess the one thing that impressed me as a child growing up at 11th and Venango in North Philadelphia was that what set Pixan apart from the Sally Stars and the Chief Halftowns and the Bertie the Bunyips of the world was that as a six, seven-year-old kid watching television, I had no clue how this woman could fly. <laughs> all right, No idea at all. Of course, now everybody understands that. But as a child watching that, what set Pixan apart from every other children's show host, for me was that she made me believe that I could do anything I wanted to do. She made me dream, basically. Whereas your, your Sally Stars of the world uh, were like you know, your aunt, or your grandmom, or something like that. Pixan was somebody that made you, you know, if, if this woman can fly, I could do radio. <laughs> All right? And upon reflection, you know, that's the kind of thing that as a, a, a young child, you really do need something to drive your dreams. I don't think young people today have that, right? And, you know, whether that's a result of modern technology or the way we raise kids today, I have no idea. I wasn't allowed to breed. I have two cats, so uh, I, I couldn't tell you as far as children are concerned. But I don't think the kids today are able to dream the way we used to be able to when we were young. And it was people like Jane Norman who gave us the ability to look beyond ourselves and to say, you know, 
I can do whatever I want. And you don't even realize it at the time until you get older and you look back. So those are my memories of Jane Norman. A woman who allowed me to just think I could do anything. I hope that helps. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thanks. Thank you very much. Now I'm going to answer one of the questions that David asked. How did she fly? I always wondered about that myself. So I did ask her. And the first time she flew at Channel 10, guess what happened? She crashed. She had no idea how to fly. So they brought in a guy from Broadway who was doing Mary Martin's Peter Pan to teach her how to fly. It took eight and a half hours. Eight and a half hours to learn how to stand there and look cute for everybody. And she was highly successful to the point, not only were young children like David enamored with her, but these guys from Upper Darby used to get up at nine o'clock in the morning, go to a bar, drink themselves silly and watch Pick Sand, and then call her to critique her show. She just loved it. Now, as a man, I understood where they were coming from. There was no one looking better in that cute little outfit than Pixanne. So she appealed to people all over the earth. She was just a great individual. And I'll give you more tidbits after our next guest, Jerry Blavitt, who's probably in the air right now. <laughs> yes, seriously. And he's, and he's here by phone. Jerry, hey. are you there? Listen, I'm in the air flying with Pix Ann out there. <laughs> I got to tell you guys, <laughs> what a great intro. She's flying through the air, <laughs> fell down and got up again and made it with Peter Pan. <laughs> No, but seriously, I, I feel badly. I mean, I, I, I was going to leave at 7 in the morning from Florida. I finally got back in here in Philadelphia. And, you know, I'm sorry I can't be with you in person, but i got to tell you about Jane Norman. She was just the sweetest lady. I mean, when I first started at Channel 10, you got to understand, I was the new kid on the block. And it was Gene London, it was Pixan, and the big guy was John Facenda. And when I started, I mean, I was doing rock and roll. And Bruce Bryant was the general manager uh, of the station at that time. And Al Hollander was the program director. And they were very, very conservative. So when I started to do rock and roll, it was the first time that CAU had seen something like this, where the host was not behind a podium. The host was dressed with a V-neck sweater and looked like one of the kids. So when I was introduced to the family of personalities, Gene London and Fixan and Facenda, they embraced me <laughs> because, you know, I, I, I knew nothing about what was really going on. I was a radio guy. And I learned about Pixan's professionalism. She, to, the, to, to everything that she did, she did it with such professionalism. And I remember the scripts before the show would go on. Because with my TV show, I had lived everything. But everything that she did was basically script. And the great writers were Matt Robinson at that time, who went on to do the Cosby show. Uh, also, Peter Duncan, who went on to cover the Vietnam War. And uh, I remember Frank Beasley, all right, uh, who was the general sales manager, was the guy that really was pushing all the local shows and also picks hands. But it was such an honor for me, a kid from South Philly that used to see these people on Channel 10, and especially for Senda. You know, who said, well, who is this rock and roll fellow that's coming along right now? You know, and it was just delightful, wonderful time in my life. Thank you very much, Jerry. Uh, flying around there with Pixan, that was very nice of you. Well, listen, thank you very much. And I'm sorry, guys, that I couldn't be there in person. But, you know, I love all of you guys. You guys truly represent what our industry is about. You never forget the people. And Jerry Wilkinson and Delcy, you have never forgotten the people who have entertained so many in radio and television and making people happy. And I appreciate you for that, guys. 
Thank you very much, Sherry. Here's another little tidbit about Pixan that you may not know. That show ran for nine and a half years in Philadelphia, and it wasn't over after nine and a half years because then she went national for another eight years. So Pixan is known all over the country. Our next speaker is Jimmy Murray. Jimmy Murray and Steve Ross right now are the hosts of Remember When, which I think is a, a great show in Philadelphia, which talks about things from our childhood. And I, I always appreciate it when they give me a call and ask me a question about the 1960s or the 1970s. I think it's fantastic. Jimmy, as you uh, probably already know, is a, uh, with the Eagles for years as the general manager. But most importantly, he started the Ronald McDonald House in Philadelphia. <laughs> which became a national cause and, and has done such great work for so many people. And I'm just proud to know Jimmy. Jimmy, come on up. Oh, there you go. I almost miss you thinning out so quickly. Let's go, Jimmy. Thanks, Billy. I love when Jerry said the, uh, the pick the team with green uniforms. So I, well, that was a good story for me because the green uniforms were an interesting part of my life. And one of the most interesting part of my life to put me in this room with all the superstars and people who have turned the world upside down by communication. I was looking at the BP up there broadcasting of Philadelphia, your logo. And I thought, that fits Pixan. She's a beautiful person. She really is. And she's of Philadelphia. I love when you told everybody how Philly she was. And how I got to know her is Steve, who will be up after me, called me one day, and I'm in the George Costanza look-alike contest. He said, Mur, I'm thinking about doing a, uh, a show. I said, well, what's the show about? He said, nothing. I said, well, good, I could do that. Yeah, he said, we're just going to talk about the good old days. And that show was on for 11 and a half years. Jackie, who was one of our main persons, and uh, we had picks on and on seven times. And uh, I'll let Steve tell you some of the great things she did. But, uh, you know, once again, I look at the BP and I thought, what a beautiful broadcast. And getting to know her, some people just have it. And I love that Jerry Blavitt talked about John Vicenda, because I know John Vicenda very well. I mean, with his voice and our two good plays a year, it looked like we won the Super Bowl. He would <laughs> NFL Films, The Sables, the greatest editors in the world. And her and I used to talk about that. I, she loved one story. She lived, Jackie, told, 191, right behind Channel 10. That's where she lived. And she loved the story about when I was trying to save Leonard from <clears throat> some of his habits. And I had this doctor who was the number one <laughs> compulsive gambler doctor in the world. And he said, Mara, I've been doing this all my life. I never had anybody do what he did. I said, what? He said, well, I was at that bar right there in 191. And he comes over and he's got the scotch and the cigarette. And he said, what are you here for, doctor? Mr. Toes, I'm here to help you with your compulsive gambling. And he looks me in the eye and he said, hell, I gave up drinking and smoking. What makes you think I can't give up gambling? He said, I've never met a guy like that. Well, that was her. She had, when Cherry talked about John Fassett, she had presence. And when she was on our, phone, on our show, the phones never stopped. And all the things that you shared, all the things people that listened to her and watched her grow up still love her to this day, even though she's in heaven. Uh, to get to know her was not just Philly. It was real. You know, in scripture, wisdom is always feminine. And she was brilliant. It didn't surprise me that she had the, the savvy to be a good enough business person. But I, I think when you try to describe Philly, I, I remember trying to describe Philly to Dick Vermeil in our first interview. And that was the toughest question. He said, Jimmy, and I have another question. We're four hours in this interview. I said, what's the question? He says, why would I come to Philadelphia? I said, what the heck's that mean? He said, the fans. <laughs> so let me tell you about Philly. I said, you're not, I'm going to be Jeremiah. You don't know who that is. I'm going to tell you three things. Not only are you going to move to Philly, you're going to move your family here. Not only are you going to move your family here, you're going to stay here the rest of your life. Not only are you going to stay the rest of your life, you're going to become a household word. That was Pixan. She was Philly, a million percent. She did win her Super Bowl. She won our hearts. I loved that Jerry's honoring her 
in her presence today. And, I, and the last thing I want to say, because um, we're not supposed to be up here this long, is uh, Bill Baldini and I go way back. And uh, we were talking about something really special. And that Al Meltzer, who's had a tough trip on the back nine, and the night before Villanova played for the championship, I happened to be there, and he and Steve Lee were always there. But before I left, I gave him my Villanova hat. And I said, if you wear this, they'll win the national championship. So I'm not going to take my hat back, but my hat's off to this beautiful lady whose presence fits people like the presence of John Vicenda and all of you great radio people. And I'm just glad to be an older boy. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. Here's another tidbit you probably didn't know. Jane's range was tremendous. She had a show teaching women how to do household chores like electricity, woodworking, plumbing. I, I, she was just an amazing individual. She also had a national kids quiz show that went network, and that lasted for quite a few years. So Jane had great range that most people didn't even know about. I, don't know, I, I didn't even get to the musical end of it, but I will a little later. Jim Crane is our next guest speaker. Jim, he's known for his great singing style, and sometimes he's called simply the voice and the singing lifeguard. I want to hear about that. He hosts a nostalgia broadcast at New Jersey Shore on WOND Radio in Atlantic City every Saturday evening. And Jane Norman evidently has been his guest many times. So Jim, come on up and tell us a little bit about it. Thank you, everybody. It's very nice. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon and welcome. And uh, I, I must say, this is I'm really honored to be here because I was handed the from Dave Kosky down at WOND. Oh, and the reason I'm a singing lifeguard is uh, I, uh, I was a lifeguard in Atlantic City for 25 years. And I, I, actually work, uh, I actually worked at Steel Pier, and it's all Ed Hurst's fault. Okay, I'm just letting you know. From knowing Ed Hurst, and I worked at WMID and with Harvey Holiday and all the great people around here. But I was given this radio show on WOND on Saturday nights, and I just said, I'm not doing any politics. I'm not going to do, I'm just going to have fun. Just going to have entertainers on and any, everybody else. And I love TV history, and I love history of uh, radio and everything. And uh, one of my earliest guests that I had was Gene London, because uh, I was very impressed by him, and uh, I got was able to get in touch with him and, and have him and everything. And uh, I asked him, I said, can you put in a good word to Jane Norman? I would love to talk to Pixan, because I was in love with her, as everybody was, you know, especially Space Girl, you know, and that, that cute little outfit, and Witchy Poo and everything else. But... Um, so she agreed to be on my show, and uh, I had her back over the, I've, like I said, I've been doing it five years. I've, I've had her back at least 10 times on the show, 10 different times. And uh, every time I had her, she was, it was a different story. We talk about New York and all the guests she had when she was up there. I actually let Chuck McCann know that she had passed away because he was really good friends with her when she was at, uh, up in New York. And um, she, she just amazed me at like, uh, her knowledge and, and everything, but she could take a good, dirty joke. That was another thing I liked about her. And um, anyway, we were supposed to do many an appearance together, but we always never were able to. And um, the one thing uh, that, you know, so we went on and on, and she was on. I promoted her albums with Paul and, and everything, and we had all these different times and things that she was doing, talk about her Broadway experiences and being up at uh, the 54 Club up there and, uh, and everything. We'd plug everything for her because, you know, you just couldn't say no to her, and she was just so nice. Um, and I grew up here in the Delaware Valley with Half Town and, and of course, uh, Uncle Pete Boyle. I have a great, can I just tell an, an Uncle Pete story? This was, Uncle Pete, I loved him, you know, with the poppers, a one -a, a two -a, and a three, you know. And he showed the little rascals, you know, and he had that little clubhouse and everything with that door. 
you know, what everybody had to go through. And one of our guys from school that I went to school with um, got to be on Pete's show over there. On, uh, it, I guess it was at CBS, I think. But where was it? Where did they do it out of? I can't remember. Oh, okay. But anyhow, so the, the kid that was um, going up to the show, he was rather big and everything. And when he tried to go through that clubhouse door, he got stuck and it was live TV. And we all got to see him on TV. And he's a lawyer now, and I still break his, break his stones about it. So that was really fun. I'm a real product of uh, the Philadelphia stuff. And Sally Starr was actually my agent in Florida for a while. And I thought that was really cool. But um, anyway, so I got to, we got, really got to know Jane very well. And I told her that my anniversary was coming up with my wife, 25 years. And uh, I mean, she didn't know us from Adam. I mean, just from the radio show and everything. And she sent us a beautiful bouquet of flowers which I thought was really cool. And uh, I used to always say to her, so she said she was downtown in Philly. I said, how many Pixan sightings did you have? You know, where people say, hey, you're Pixan, you know. So that's really something. But I, when she got sick, and uh, this is kind of hard, uh, she had admitted to me how sick she was. And I tried to call her every week. I tried to call her at least twice a week just to tell her a couple jokes and see how she was. And when I got the caretaker for her that one time, I had that chill up my back and I knew there was something really wrong. And I did get to talk to her one more time before she passed and I thanked her for all of the stuff that she taught all of us kids here in the Delaware Valley over the years. And um, it was just such, such a nice to know her and to interview her and keep her legacy alive. And she'll always fly around my house and I have the picture of Space Girl, I'll let you guys see it, that she signed for me. And that's in my office on the wall. So I really appreciate you folks asking me up here today and uh, Dick Sheeran and all those guys have been on my show and uh, I wanna interview you, I wanna get you on my show. And Terry Ruggles and those other guys. But uh, thank you so much. and. It's a real pleasure to be here. It's my honor. Thank you. Thank you, Liam. Thank you. Thank you. Always a pleasure. All right. By the way, I forgot to mention, I told you about that uh, national kids show that she had nationally. And you know who the host was? Anybody know? Michael Landon. I mean, th th this lady had some really. Yeah. Yeah, Eugene Horowitz. Very good. All right. One person that I tend, I, I forgot, and not by choice, but is uh, Steve Ross, who, uh, who does the radio show with Jimmy Murray about Philadelphia, who is Mr. Nice Guy, he does the ho harness racing at, uh, at the park, yes. and he worked for like eight or nine radio stations, correct? Never met a station I couldn't get, that I couldn't ruin. He's the man, all okay. right. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Um, thank you, it is a great honor to be asked to be here today to pay tribute to Janie Norman. I only knew her as Janie. When she would call and she'd leave a message on my voicemail, she went, hi Steve, it's Janie. In that dear, sweet voice. And if I had to use one word to describe her, and everybody has alluded to this, she was special. She was a great lady. She was humble. She was caring. She was talented. Uh, Bill had mentioned that um, Eugene Normandy and the Philadelphia Orchestra used her sad song or sad story uh, when she was eight years old, a composition at one of their concerts. And she played the piano before her feet could touch the pedals. We were honored to have her as a guest many times on Remember When, our radio show, a nostalgia retro radio program. And, uh, she was so genuine, and when she took the phone calls, all of the listeners who were calling in adored her. And when they got to speak to her, there were kids all over again. And one of the best call out of all of them, there were so many examples of adoration for her. The best was a woman, I think it was Barbara from the Northeast, and 
I said, hi, you don't remember when with Jane Norman? And she said, hi, Miss Norman? She said, yes. She said, you were my teacher in kindergarten. And now I'm a grandmother. That gets better. She said, what is your name? And she told her. She said, no, what, is your, what was your maiden name? And she told her. And she went, of course I remember you. And they went on and on and on. It was, but the great thing was she called her Miss Norman. Back when respect was still in style, remember that? And Jane would take every call and she was so sweet and so dear and her speaking voice was very soft and understated but she, all of the words, she articulated perfectly like a teacher, just like when she sang her songs. Whenever she sang her songs, the phrasing, the articulation, you heard every word. It was Sinatra-esque. And one of the great things I remember was Jackie Strauss and I, lovely Jackie right here, we went on a bus and we took that ride to New York to Manhattan to 54 Below, which, let me give you some nostalgia here, for those of you who don't know, 54 Below was, at one time, Studio 54. And I was there, I've been there, never mind. <laughs> That's a different story for another show. Um, and she was amazing, she performed wonderfully. Paul Jost, is Paul here? Paul was there, and we were sitting ringside and when the show was over, I said, Jane, great job, Janie. And she said, do you think so? How did I do? And I said, you killed. And she was like a little kid. She went, really, really? I, that, that was just the essence of Janie Norman. That's who she was. Didn't have a phony bone in her body. She was totally genuine. The other thing is that her outfit that she flew around in could have fit her on the day she passed. The woman never gained an ounce. And I used to marvel every time I would see her. And I said, what is it with you? You look so young. And Janie was one of these people that, you know, I think one of the things Janie would not have liked was a lot of the obituaries that I read all contained her age. And she would have hated that. In fact, one of the funniest things that she said was, how can all these people in their 50s remember me and things I said when I'm only 25 now? <laughs> But that was Janie Norman. And I guess the final thing that we ha her and I had in common was our love of tennis. And Janie, of course, she had the rough life. She lived here in the ghetto at 191 in Bella Kinwood. You know, and she, she dealt with that for half the year. And then she got on a plane and she flew out to her, her digs in Palm Springs. But she earned it, of course, as Bill had mentioned. She was a smart talent. So many people in our business have great talent and they're lousy managers. They can't take care of the money or whatever else. Janie could take care of that as well. But she was intricately involved in the Indian Mills um, tournament in Palm Desert every year. Um, it is known as the fifth major for those of you who don't know about tennis. And all the top stars have to appear there. And she became very friendly with Roger Federer, and Rafa Nadal and people like that. And she got to meet them and talk to them, whatever else. And she loved that. And she, she went on about how much she loved Roger and he was such a terrific guy and he was so good and caring, a lot like her. And I think, I thought of Janie on Sunday because on Sunday they played the Shanghai Rolex Masters Tournament, a big tournament, a Masters 1000 event. And in the final were Roger Federer and Rafa Nadal Roger is 36, Rafa is 31, and after some downtime, they all reemerged inexplicably to become the number one and number two players in the world once again at their advanced age. Not an age where you say, well, these guys are still playing at their chosen field of endeavor, but at the very top of their game. And all I could think of was how proud Janie Norman would have been of Roger Federer, who won the tournament over Rafa Nadal in straight sets. And I will just end by saying, 
her and I were supposed to play tennis, but I always found a way to beg out because I didn't want to be humbled by her, and she was a great tennis player. <laughs> so all I could say is it, it's nice that we were here not mourning her passing because you can't do that with her because her life was so worth celebrating. God bless you, Janie, and thank you, everybody. As you now know, Jane was a great producer. She produced four albums, four musical albums that were just fantastic. And she also was most proud of pro producing two sons and three grandchildren. And one of those grandchildren is here right now. Her name is Liz Statler, and she is bringing some of the memorabilia that uh, Jane left behind, and she's going to present it to broadcast pioneers. Please come on up and say a few words. Oh, here we go. Uh, by, by the way, Dick Kearney could not make it today. He had injured his foot. But he did want me to tell you this one memory that he had of Jane. The show was live Monday through Friday. But in the infinite wisdom of management, they said, let's put the show on Saturday and Sunday. Well, I'm not going to do live shows. So they taped it. So it's a Friday afternoon in November, about 55 years ago. And they just finished taping the Saturday show, which didn't get aired for a couple of weeks. And they started the Sunday show when somebody ran in, broke the light that said, on the air, ran into the air studio and said, President Kennedy just was shot and he's in bad shape. Jane sat down and on the toadstool and just was in tears because she thought so much of President Kennedy. And at that time, they didn't know what was going on. But Jane said, I just can't continue with the taping. We'll have to, you know, pick up later on. And of course, they never did pick up. And uh, that's one of uh, Dick's memories. Another one is that they had a circus act come in, and they had a hoop that was in flames. And they set it on flames, and the animal jumped through there. And he jumped back through, and he jumped through, and they said, that's great. And they went to put it out, and they couldn't get the flame out. And they took a fire extinguisher, and it still won't, wouldn't go out. And in fact, that was one of the clips. Jane said, she made more money on that clip selling it to Dick Clark's, you know, bloopers than he did, she did doing a whole year of Pick Sam. So, anyhow, Thank you. sorry, we're, we're here to memor just, you know, re remembering your grandmother. Sorry. Yes. Um, uh, anyhow, come, um, come, come to the microphone so we can hear you. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Liz. I'm Jane's grandma granddaughter. And um, on behalf of everyone in our family, I'm going to get emotional. <laughs> I just want to say it's, we're very touched that everyone's out here today and that you're all here remembering her. And this is so wonderful. And she would have loved everyone who's here telling stories, reminiscing. And um, we're just so pleased um, that everyone's here and remembering. And also, um, I wanted to present, um, there's some memorabilia that we're going to give, but this is one piece that we wanted to give in person, wow. is, um, wow. And we have the hats. <laughs> we, get, we get the hat too, that's great. And the original and the, Oh, wow. wow. On behalf of Broadcast Pioneers and our entire membership, thank you very much, and we'll do our best to preserve this. By the way, just so our membership and, and other people here, uh, we're not just going to put that in a box and put it in storage. Uh, we're going to have it pre preserved professionally. Actually, 
We're thinking a good consultant is one of our members, Gene London, because you know Gene has an, a fabulous dress collection. My only fear is if I call Gene, he's going to actually want that for his collection. So I'll have to make sure he's not never anywhere near that. But we do take our archive very serious. Anybody here, the material that we have in the archive comes from you people, not from the stations. Over the years, the stations have just trashed the entire history of our industry. It's you people that are helping us to preserve it. Um, we just got a 1957 Larry Ferrari kinescope. We just finished digitizing 37 reels of Bill Weber material. Uh, was donated to us by the Weber estate several years ago. And it took us, a, it was an expensive process. They're beautiful. If you're coming to the banquet, by the way, we're going to run a one minute clip from 1974 of Wee Willie's Cartoon Club in, on location in Rome. But the stuff was, is expensive to do. So if you want to be supportive, we would appreciate it. We're very laid back in our fundraising. A lot of organizations hit you every week for money, and we don't do that. But we can sure use your support. We don't want you eating dog food for lunch in order to help us out. No, that's not what we're asking. We're asking if you have a little bit of extra money, you can put it to good use by helping us preserve your history because history is only what gets saved. If nobody saved a portrait of George Washington, how would we know what he looks like? We wouldn't. Okay, Bill. Okay, Jerry. Yes, it's very difficult to follow that, especially that little outfit. It's amazing, isn't it? Can you imagine Jerry wearing that thing? Nah. In, in closing, uh, I just want to share some, a thought that Jane left me with when I did that interview with her last year. And I, at the end, I said, Jane, how would you like people to remember you? And she looked at me and she said, you know what? I want them to think about me and think about wonderment and joy that I brought to their lives. And I, and I remember looking at her and I said, Jane, you were a rousing success. And she was. <laughs>